Hello, I'm Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute at Washington State University. And on behalf of the Institute, I want to welcome you out to our event today with Professor Jim Gibson, who will be talking about inequality in the courts. I want to apologize for being a little late. We had some technical difficulties we had to iron out, but I think we've got uh, everything together at this point. So uh, today's event is part of a series, a semester long series that the Foley Institute has this year on the politics of inequality. Um, the series uh, actually began a few weeks ago with a distinguished lecture delivered by Sir Angus Deaton from Princeton University. In all, it will include at least 10 separate events featuring discussions by distinguished scholars and commentators on various aspects of inequality, including today's discussion with uh, Jim Gibson. If you'd like more information about this series or any of our events at the Foley Institute, you should visit us at our website, foley.wsu.edu. If you miss any of these events, you can see them later on the Foley Institute's YouTube station. Uh, and I also wanna thank the College of Arts and Sciences for their support of this series and of all Foley Institute uh, events uh, at, as well. So uh, without any further ado, I'm gonna get right to our guests since we're running a little bit late today. It's my pleasure to introduce Jim Gibson, who is the Sidney W. Sowers Professor of Government at Washington University in St. Louis. Jim is also Professor of African and African American Studies and the Director of the Program on Citizenship and Democratic Values at the Wiedenbaum Center on the Economy, Government, and Public Policy. In South Africa, Jim holds the position of Professor Extraordinary in Political Science at Stellenbosch University. Professor Gibson has published well over 100 refereed articles and chapters in a wide range of national and international social science journals. Jim is, has also published nine books, including Electing Judges, The Surprising Effects of Campaign on Judicial Legitima uh, Campaigning on Judicial Legitimacy, which was published by Chicago University Press, Overcoming Historical Injustices, Land Reconciliation in South Africa, which is published by Cambridge University Press, and Citizens, Courts, and Confirmations, published by Princeton University Press. Jim's research, as you can tell, uh, his interests are incredibly wide ranging. He currently is involved in research projects examining public reactions to the trials of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, on public intolerance and the perception of freedom in the American political uh, culture, on public attitudes about campaign contributions, and a new project where he's examining the impact of the symbols of judicial authority on perceptions of law and courts. His most recent book, Judging Inequality, State Supreme Courts and the Inequality Crisis, uh, which is co-authored with Michael Nelson and published by Russell Sage, is going to form the basis of his talk today. And on a personal note, I just want to say that Jim is an old friend of mine. He's been at, uh, in Pullman for previous Foley events, and so it's a real pleasure to welcome him back uh, to the Foley Institute, if only virtually today. So uh, uh, Jim has indicated he plans to speak for about 30 to 40 minutes, and we should have some time for discussion after that if you have questions. Send those to me at tsfoley at wsu.edu. Again, that's TS is in Tom S. Foley at wsu.edu. So, Jim, I'm going to turn the time over to you now, and I'll be back with some uh, questions at the uh, after your presentation. Oh, Jim, I think you're on mute. You have to uh, put your speaker on. You would think I would have learned that by now, wouldn't you? Uh, Cornell, thank you very much for that kind introduction and uh, the opportunity to come and speak to you all about uh, this new book. Uh, while I'm uh, introducing uh, the uh, talk, let me go ahead and share my screen and let's see if I can uh, do two things at once. And um, so uh, Cornell is in fact correct that I have been to the Foley Institute in the past and it was a wonderful visit. I actually uh, don't remember uh, the topic uh, at the time, uh, but I do remember Cornell's hospitality and it was absolutely uh, fantastic and I uh, had a wonderful time. I hope at some point when this COVID is finished, there'll be an opportunity to visit uh, Pullman again. Uh, can, uh, Cornell, can you see the screen? Yes, we can, we can see it. Okay, and I'm gonna try to make it full screen. Um, 
but that has to, well, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna cheat and do this, especially in the interest of, of time. Oh, okay, so uh, uh, interestingly enough, uh, Judging Inequality is actually published today. Uh, and so the press releases and all that went out uh, today. This is a book with uh, Michael Nelson uh, from Penn State. Michael's a, a Washington U PhD, and uh, we've been working on this project for uh, quite some time. Like a lot of people in the world, we were inspired by Thomas Piketty's book on inequality published uh, almost a decade ago in which widespread inequality was uh, documented. Um, but we started thinking a little bit about uh, inequality from a very different perspective, certainly different from the perspective of an economist. Our project was really influenced by uh, three, um, three different uh, forces. Uh, first is uh, Marty Gillens. Uh, Marty published, uh, again, probably about a decade ago, Affluence and Influence. It's one of the most important books of uh, my uh, generation. And um, uh, it deals with the influence that the wealthy have over the legislature. Um, we were also uh, influenced by uh, school finance, um, school, school finance, um, I'm sorry, we had a little bit of glitch at the beginning. And so I've got to not interrupt again. I was also influenced by the school finance literature and that is litigation having to do with the equality of school uh, funding. Um, I always say uh, Kansas uh, came as a, a gift to us uh, because uh, Kansas is sort of the poster child for interbranch conflict over the funding of public schools in Kansas, a litigation that went on for uh, literally ever and probably is still going on today. I was, we were also influenced by uh, Professor Helen Hirschkoff, uh, who is a law professor at uh, NYU. And what we learned from uh, Hirschkoff is that state constitutions are full of ammunition for judges who seek to, to advance greater political, legal, economic, and social equality. Uh, these constitutions are really sort of interesting to read. In New Jersey, one has a, a right to uh, happiness. Uh, in New Hampshire, one has a constitutional right to a ski trail that is at least uh, uh, six feet wide or something like that. So these constitutions really allow judges to do many of the things that they might not otherwise do uh, without the, um, the ammunition of uh, state constitutions. Of course, one of the most famous examples is, uh, comes from the Iowa Constitution, where the Equal Protection Clause lay dormant for a uh, hundred years or more, but was uh, resuscitated by the Iowa Supreme Court in about 1910 or so, uh, I beg your pardon, about 2010 or so, to um, allow a same-sex marriage or to grant constitutional protection to same-sex marriage in um, Iowa. So what I concluded from that is judges can do pretty much anything they want. They have the legal ammunition. The question becomes whether they have the motives to employ these constitutions to advance or retard greater equality in their states. So the question for us and what makes our research unique is that we ask what role do, um, do uh, courts uh, play? Now, in thinking about this, it, it uh, seemed like it was a pretty formidable, um, uh, but uh, difficult project. Difficult indeed, especially since we're looking at the workhorse of the American judiciary. We're looking at the state courts. Here's a little graph um, that simply shows the number of cases filed 
per year in all of the 50 states versus the federal courts. So the conclusion here is about uh, as plain as day, and that is that uh, the state courts uh, carry the load of litigation in this country. But the state Supreme Courts are also uh, the courts that have the final say on the meaning of the state constitutions. And in many, many instances, uh, that final say cannot even be addressed by the federal courts. Uh, and so these are the courts that affect people's lives, their day-to-day -day lives uh, in America, not the US Supreme Court. Now, a project like this requires a banker. Indeed, this project was sufficiently large that it required two bankers. Uh, we greatly appreciate the support of the Law and Science Program at the National Science Foundation and also the uh, Russell Sage uh, Foundation, who actually stepped in when it became apparent that our resources from NSF were insufficient. So we very much appreciate the support of these two organizations. Now, the first task in a project like this is conceptualizing equality and conceptualizing it in terms that are relevant to litigation. We identified what we call three domains, uh, each with subcomponents. And the first uh, uh, is cases that pertain to the rights of workers and employees. And this is litigation over collective bargaining rights, uh, litigation over employment at will policies that I'll talk about in uh, just a minute. The second domain pertains to the rights of minorities. Uh, here we uh, put in the uh, school finance litigation, uh, which carries on in many states even today and is fantastically interesting in my view. Uh, we also examine cases pertaining to gay rights and then we also uh, uh, examine cases uh, pertaining to election law. The third domain uh, is cases uh, relevant to equal access to the state's justice institutions. And here we're talking about mandatory arbitration policies, which of course all of us are affected uh, by today, class action policies, policies regarding the payment of attorney's fees, and uh, damages caps in civil litigation, a category that some people might uh, want to call uh, so-called uh, tort reform. So uh, these are the three major uh, domains that uh, we examined. Uh, but let me put a little bit of meat on the bone. Um, I'm going to tell you very briefly about a very famous case in Iowa one that attracted a great deal of public attention. And you're probably thinking same-sex marriage. It is not the same-sex marriage case. It is a fairly dry legal doctrine called employment at will. And it pertains to all of us today. And man, it is super relevant today with COVID and everything else. But let me tell you about this case. So it's a famous case in Iowa. It's Nelson versus Knight. Uh, Dr. Knight uh, became se sexually attracted to his longtime dental assistant, Melissa Nelson. They carried on a flirtation that was consensual, no question about that, but not sexual. Doctors Knight, Dr. Knight's wife wasn't wild about all this. So she demanded that the dentist fire the dental assistant. He did, she sued. So um, this is the downside of going this route. Uh, so she sued claiming that she was the victim of uh, sex discrimination. And that is uh, a, a discrimination that is illegal in Iowa. As you probably know, many forms of discrimination are not illegal. Uh, in any state. So the Iowa Supreme Court decided in favor of the dentist and in a unanimous decision by all seven of the male justices, they sided with Dr. Knight, who is in fact a male. Three Democrats uh, uh, voted uh, in a favor and uh, four Republicans uh, voted also voted in favor. 
for a unanimous decision for the dentist. So the justices claim that the case was not about sex. The chief justice wrote, the resolution of the case turns on context. Was Nelson's termination a response by Dr. Knight to a personal relationship or was it his response to Nelson's status as a woman? The court answered personal relationship, despite Nelson's argument that the personal relationship occurred because she's a woman. And so the court uh, ruled saying uh, in favor of the dentist, saying that the uh, firing of the assistant was lawful, even though the court recognized it had nothing to do with fairness. So this is an example of what we regard as an equality case. Do employees have equal footing with employers? Uh, and the answer, generally speaking, is they do not, although courts um, have, um, have um, uh, uh, figured out ways uh, to uh, get around the employment or will, at will doctrine under certain circumstances. So there's no uh, listing of these cases. There's nowhere that you can go uh, and find all litigation on employment at will. So we had to build a database. Uh, we started with Lexis and we looked at their case class classifications and tried to identify cases relevant to these three domains of, of different forms of equality. We identified 14 thousand cases, we read those cases, determined that 8,000 were not um, relevant and 6,000 were, and then we proceeded to code the attributes of those cases. Uh, for the political scientist in the group, this is very much the, the same as the coding of the US Supreme Court the uh, coding uh, pioneered by Harold Spaeth at Michigan State, in which uh, uh, US Supreme Court cases are coded as liberal or conservative. We coded the cases as advancing or retarding equality. We did so in a highly, highly reliable fashion. That is, we uh, did a test about whether we could reach the same conclusion and in the vast, vast majority of the tests, a second coding of the cases produced the same uh, outcome. Uh, that's in part because we had very explicit rules. Uh, this took uh, at least uh, two years, maybe even a third year to do. So we built a database. It's for all 50 courts. Uh, we, in the beginning, by the way, uh, excluded criminal. Uh, you may criticize this for that, but criminal just became, un, uh, would have become unmanageable. So by excluding criminal, we exclude the two criminal Supreme Courts, one in Oklahoma and one in Texas. So in fact, we have 50 uh, state Supreme Courses, uh, Supreme Courts, litigation you know, for a 26 year period, the 13,000 cases turned into 6,000 relevant cases decided by nearly a thousand judges, casting 37,000 votes and um, pertaining to the rights of minorities, the rights of workers and employees, access and access to uh, justice institutions. Now, let's turn to some results. Of the 6,000, about 3,000 were a pro-equality and about 3,000 were not pro-equality. A really, really close division of 49% versus 51%. But you know, those figures don't mean anything because they characterize 50 courts. This is what's meaningful in our view. And that is the variation across the uh, various uh, states um, from a low of about 25% of the decisions favoring equality in Texas to a high of about 75% of the cases um, of favoring equality in uh, Arizona. Uh, the thing that I want you to appreciate from this graph is just the tremendous amount of variation uh, 
that we observed in how the state Supreme Courts uh, have um, addressed the various uh, issues of equality and inequality in the litigation that they've decided. Now, the basic goal of this project is to account for this variability. And it's actually quite a bit more complicated than that because it's not just variability across states. As I've suggested to you, it's variability across time, it's variability across justices, it's variability across cases, it's variability across states with their individual political cultures, et cetera. So it's a pretty complicated uh, project at the end of the day. Let me show you a result. Don't you just hate tables like this? We see these in political science all the time where people put up tables like this and expect folks to uh, be able to make some sense out of it. I'm not going to uh, force you through anything like this. I'm gonna to try to extract from that table a handful of important conclusions uh, that are uh, written in English, not in statistics, uh, to uh, try to describe to you uh, what it is that we've found. Now, we started with a pretty simple little model that starts with the social background of the judges goes through their educational experiences, their career choices uh, that uh, we expected would produce or shape their attitudes and values. And these attitudes and values would in turn uh, determine how they voted on cases on the Supreme, uh, state Supreme Court with in fact some contextual factors influencing that as well. Uh, this didn't turn out to be uh, that uh, fruitful, uh, the, uh, the background side of the model. Uh, really only two uh, variables were uh, kind of consistently influential in predicting whether judges were liberals or conservatives. One is their uh, uh, age, uh, and that is uh, a little bit surprising to us the younger the judge, the more conservative he or she was, is. And then the second is in-state versus out-of-state education, uh, with in-state uh, education producing a more uh, conservative uh, judges. We were able to estimate the cost of the education of all 1,000 judges, uh, and we pursued a whole bunch of um, hypotheses about social class, but because of the liberalizing influence of out-of-state education at prestigious law schools, uh, none of that turned out to be uh, very uh, fruitful. What is fruitful, however, is the last little block in that uh, figure. And that is the connection between uh, attitudes or ideologies and the voting behavior of the judges. Here's an, an example of the relationship. And what this simply shows is that judges, the x-axis is defined by ideology, ranging from liberal as a negative number to conservative as a positive. The y-axis is the percentage of votes in favor of equality. What this figure shows is that conservative judges tended to vote against equality and liberal judges tended to vote in uh, favor of equality. Now, you're probably thinking, how did they measure liberalism and conservatism? Um, it's a little bit complicated. Uh, we relied on Adam Bonica's work at Stanford uh, in which he estimated ideological positions largely on the basis of the campaign, the public campaign contributions that judges have made. And so we were able to score all of the judges on in terms of their ideology. Um, what's also important about this graph is that it's not nearly as strong as the same graph for the US Supreme Court would be. Uh, we have some uh, uh, thoughts about why in a, a second, but 
Uh, this is a substantial and significant relationship, but it is far from an overwhelming relationship. Now, this same relationship exists with the Washington Supreme Court. Uh, 10 to one, you all know uh, a whole lot more about this graph than I do. Uh, but what this depicts is the ideological scores of each of the uh, state Supreme Court justices in Washington State uh, with uh, Justice uh, Dolliver uh, being the most conservative on uh, the ideological measure uh, and uh, Justice Owens being the most uh, liberal. And it plots that against their voting behavior uh, while on the court. Again, this is not an overwhelming, it's not an overwhelming relationship. It's a pretty good one, it's better than average. But what, uh, what it shows is that judges on the Washington Supreme Court uh, were to some degree at least voting their ideological preferences in these cases, um, in these cases uh, pertaining to equality. Democrats and Republicans differ. Well, we know that, don't we? But they differ on the state Supreme Courts as well. What this uh, graph shows is the ideological distribution on the left of the Democrats and the right of the Republicans. And uh, th this shows that the average of Democratic judges is dramatically more liberal than that of Republican judges. And it further shows that uh, the overlap uh, is uh, is a uh, pretty small, but we have very few, not zero to be sure. We have very few liberal uh, Republican judges, and we have very few conservative Republican judges. Party makes a difference. Democrats uh, favor equality more by about eight percentage points. Again, this is an average across uh, all of the states and all of the justices. And in fact, that relationship is a little bit weaker in Washington. Um, maybe during the uh, discussion, uh, you'll have some insights on that. But Democrats barely voted in favor of equality more than half the time. And Republicans did vote in favor of equality of, uh, half the time on your court, on the Washington State Court, for a difference of only uh, five um, percentage points. So the conclusion that we reach out, out, out of all of this is ideology is important, but there's got to be a whole lot more to the story than what um, uh, than a simple um, um, story about um, attitudes and behavior. Why in the relationship stronger? Well, we know a couple of things about why. One thing we know, uh, I beg your pardon, um, uh, I was jumping ahead too fast. We do know that Washington state judges are dramatically more liberal than Democratic judges are dramatically more liberal than Republican judges, um, even though that doesn't spill over into their uh, voting behavior. Now, why that's the case, we're not sure, but here's one potential explanation. Only about 30% of these 6,000 cases were less than unanimous. Let me say it differently. 70% were uh, unanimous. And in those 70% of uh, uh, cases, uh, Democrats are voting the same as Republicans, of course, just as in my uh, dental assistant uh, uh, example uh, from uh, Iowa. So these consensual norms tend to uh, mitigate or uh, reduce the impact of ideology. We sort of believe that ideology is still important in the initial votes on these cases, but the desire to appear to be unanimous overwhelms that in a great many of the, um, the, uh, uh, the states. Uh, in uh, this uh, case, the uh, figure for Washington state is actually 50%. 50% are unanimous and 50% are not. Now, a second important finding uh, is not really new news, 
Uh, if any of y'all have uh, read Bert Kritzer's new book, you know this already, it's a fabulous book. But uh, what this graph shows, and what Kritzer shows as well, is that the liberal dominance on the state Supreme Courts was uh, eliminated uh, between 1990 and 2015. You can see on the left-hand side of the graph, which is 1990, that the Democrats, that the liberals, but, uh, I should say, the liberals were dominate, uh, dominant on the state Supreme Courts. And by the end of our study in 2015, the uh, average ideological score of the judges was just about zero, indicating a balance of liberals and conservatives. The same can be seen on ideology. The figure in 1990 was 34% of Republican. The figure in 2015 is 54% of Republican. So uh, what we have today, uh, or at least in 2015, is a group of state su uh, Supreme Court justices who are fairly equally balanced between uh, Democrats and Republicans. Again, I don't want you to get the wrong impression here. The Maryland Supreme Court is virtually 100% Democratic, always has been, always will be. The South Dakota uh, Supreme Court is about 100% Republican always has been, always will be. But um, generally speaking, the Democratic advantage that existed in the state courts in 1990 has been uh, erased. Now that's important, we believe. That's important because we think it has uh, big implications for judicial independence. Uh, I want to try to simplify uh, some of this, but part of our analysis looked at how the state Supreme Courts fit in to the, uh, the constellation of political institutions in the state, the House, the Senate, and the governor, recognizing the Nebraska exception, of course. And so what we found is that over time, uh, divided control of those three institutions, that's the graph at the top. Over time, divided control significantly decreased. Um, uh, we've got a little bit of tick up here at the end, and that's really just a function of, of 2015 elections, which are very small. Uh, but divided control uh, has become less common. And if you look at it, it's about uh, just about half of the states uh, have divided control across the three branches. Uh, this uh, a portion of the graph shows Republican ascendancy, and this one shows uh, a democratic decline. But what we think we're seeing here is that uh, state Supreme Courts have more than in the past become part of the governing coalition in the state. They've become part of the team that uh, sets policy uh, for uh, the state. Now that's not a revolutionary finding, at least in some sense. Um, the political scientists and judicial scholars among us will recognize uh, Bob Dahl's famous, famous paper in 1957, in which he argued that the federal courts are not independent. Specifically, Dahl said, the fact is then that the policy views dominant on the US Supreme Court are never for long out of line with the policy views dominant among the lawmaking majorities of the United States. Consequently, it would be most unrealistic to suppose that the court would, for more than a few years at most, stand against any major alternatives sought by a lawmaking majority. That's the conventional wisdom in um, political science. What Dahl showed for the uh, federal courts, we believe that we have confirmed for the state courts. Now, how does this work? Well, uh, that complicated table I mentioned a while back uh, uh, supports this kind of conclusion. First, liberal states, states with liberal public opinion, select uh, liberal state, uh, uh, democratic state governor, governments, and Democrats select uh, liberal judges. 
That's this linkage over here is the, we've always known that public opinion drives uh, state governments very strongly, uh, but those state governments then select uh, Supreme Court judges who share their own values and these two coefficients are reasonably large. So this leads us to believe that uh, the uh, state courts are actually part of the team, part of, the, um, part of who governs in the individual states. Now, this is a public opinion explanation. We, we think it's, it's a correct explanation, but it is abetted by something we call strategic retirements. This, we think, is a very interesting uh, graph. Uh, this is a graph of the states that elect their judges. Well, states that elect their judges don't always uh, elect their judges in the first place. What I mean by that is that judges retire before their term expires. And because they retire, governors, typically governors, not always, but typically, governors have the right to uh, appoint a replacement judge. That replacement judge then faces the electorate at the next election. And, uh, and during that, um, during that process uh, uh, runs as an incumbent. <clears throat> What's interesting, we believe, is that this pertains to nearly all of the judges in Minnesota. This pertains to nearly all of the judges in uh, Georgia. In Washington, it's about half of the judges initially ascend to the bench through an appointment process rather than an election process. This down here is Louisiana, and Louisiana forbids the, for, uh, the uh, judge uh, who uh, serves as interim judge from serving, uh, and therefore the, uh, that judge, of course, can't be elected, and the answer is zero. The states do a number of things to protect the incumbency and advantage. Sorry, I jumped over. This is a Minnesota ballot. And you can see in here the state Supreme Court. And right after World War II, the legislature in Minnesota decided to indicate on the ballot who's an incumbent and who's not. And so the advantage of incumbency, which is big in the first place, political scientists have documented all over the, the place, the advantage of the, uh, of the um, uh, of incumbency carries over into the election and governors get state Supreme Court judges that they um, prefer. Now let me, uh, I'm about to summarize, but let me just make a very simple point. Uh, Judge Sugarman published a, a book a, long, a couple of years ago in which he showed that ju uh, judicial elections, now listen to this, because it's not what you think. Judicial elections were created to enhance judicial independence, enhance independence. We find that that's not the case through the mechanisms that we've just talked about. And when it comes to equality, we think that courts are simply the extension of the state government. Where the, um, where the uh, Democrats dominate, pro-equality judges are put on the bench and pro-equality um, outcomes um, occur. Uh, where uh, Republicans dominate, conservatives are put on the bench and anti-equality decisions occur. Let me very quickly uh, sum up. The federal courts are unaccountable. Yes, we know that. Uh, this lack of accountability, some have shown, tends to aid overprivileged minorities. Um, and there are millions of examples of taxation, regulation, blah, blah. Judicial elections were designed to enhance judicial in independence. And one might assume that the greater accountability to the majority would almost automatically produce greater accountability because that's what pe uh, greater equality because that's what people want. That's not so. Some majorities in this country favor inequality. State governments are closely connected to majority 
policy preferences, and state governments care about these state courts. Kansas is the uh, poster child. If you don't uh, believe me, just ask former uh, Governor Brownback. Independent courts for these state institutions are undesirable. And elections in particular can be very disruptive. Uh, and we um, uh, um, spend some time uh, with our uh, favorite uh, Supreme Court Justice, Roy Moore in Alabama. Uh, he's a great poster child for this uh, point, not on his first election, remember he was kicked off the court, but then the people re-elected him to the Alabama Supreme Court. And that can be very disruptive to a state government. How do you influence elections? Well, you've got the power of incumbency, you put uh, put it on the ballot, and Minnesota and other states even went so far as to make it illegal to uh, talk about policy during elections. That's no longer true because of Republican Party of Minnesota versus White, but the state governments have done everything they could to protect their incumbents. A strategic retirement is an extremely powerful tool. You know that in the debate over Breyer uh, today. Uh, and uh, the goal of strategic retirement is to uh, limit uh, judicial uh, independence, to make these courts uh, more susceptible to influence by the, um, by the state governments. That's it on the book, but as to the future, these courts are the ones uh, that run the elections in the states. Uh, they manage election uh, controversies. Uh, I don't know for sure, but I wouldn't um, doubt that in 2022 and in 2024, election outcomes are going to be decided by these state Supreme Courts. And I believe that the government of Georgia, the government of Minnesota, the government of New York is working full time to make sure that these are not independent courts, that they will do the bidding of the dominant party in uh, the states. And I bet they are redoubling their efforts to get their people, our people, on the bench. I'm sorry for the glitches, um, um, but uh, thank you for listening. And I'm happy to uh, respond to any uh, questions, uh, comments, or uh, criticisms that you might have. Thank you. Hey, great, Jim. Uh, can you turn off your screen share? Will do. Okay. Uh, I th think so. So, uh, so I got lots of questions here. Uh, I'm going to start off with two about uh, the particular finding that 70% of your cases were unanimous and 30% were not unanimous. And the first question actually is, uh, comes from me. <laughs> and I, and I want to focus on those 30% uh, or excuse me, the 70%. And that is, uh, doesn't that seem to indicate that there's, um, that there's something more at play than ideology, obviously, or party appointment? Um, and wouldn't uh, the obvious answer there be the law? And I wonder if you did anything to look at variation in state Supreme Courts and rights provisions in state Supreme Courts or the progressivity of legislation in different states that might have dictated those outcomes. And let me give you the second question involving this uh, same finding. It comes from Mike Salamone, who you might know is one of my colleagues here at WSU. He asks, uh, what does the correlation look like for ideology and pro-equality voting when you just consider non-unanimous cases? If it's stronger, would that imply a non-ideological component to some of these cases? So, oh, now you're uh, mute. Uh, we're not getting your, your audio. I think, yeah, there you go. Would you like me to respond now? Yeah. Okay, let me take the second first because it's dead easy. Um, so um, the graph that I showed, let me back up a second. Most of our analysis is of 37,000 votes, votes, judge votes, 37,000. But that gets complicated for people to really get their heads around. So what I tried to show you is a graph with the unit of analysis being the justice. 
So we score justice on ideology, then we ask the percentage of cases in which that justice voted in favor of equality. We imposed a minimum of 10 cases because of, uh, we didn't want you know, one or two cases uh, to have disproportionate influence. Now that's of 6,000. If in fact we did the same analysis, we would be doing it of 30% of 6,000, 1,800 cases. And the number of judges would be very small and would be very, very unstable. Uh, the uh, unanimity variable uh, doesn't have much influence in the big multivariate model. Um, but that's the reason why uh, we haven't um, focused on these non-unanimous uh, non um, uh, cases. Um, it is possible uh, that law, uh, and likely that law has a lot of influence or some influence on the outcomes of these judges, but we see cases on things like school finance that are unanimous. Well, the law allows um, a yes vote and a no vote. And what we believe most likely happens is that judges vote their ideology, they look at the division, and then they believe that it's politically uh, unwise to release a less than unanimous decision. We know the US Supreme Court has done that in the past. We know it did it in Brown. We know it did it in the uh, Nixon tapes case and so on. So uh, we don't have evidence uh, uh, that ideology uh, uh, determines the initial private vote, but we uh, also don't uh, necessarily uh, say that ideology has uh, a no role. Um, you know, uh, Cornell, uh, maybe the biggest Achilles heel of uh, this project is our failure to take into account legislative responses to court decisions. Um, because um, again, Kansas being the perfect uh, example, the legislature acted, the court ruled, the legislature acted, the court responded to the legislature's action, the, uh, the court uh, legislature ruled again, and uh, on and on and on. And I believe that that litigation is now in its seventh iteration. Uh, we did control for the decision below. We do uh, argue that, um, that uh, cases in which the outcome is clear because law dominates, law is clear, are not cases that are appealed because litigants don't wanna waste their money. So we don't have a perfect answer to you. All we have is a couple of arguments to uh, suggest uh, that um, that even when you factor these in, ideology seems to have uh, some relationship. So uh, Gus Waters asks why the younger justices tend to be more conservative. And he asks whether this is part of a movement away from the Warren Court era uh, towards a more cons uh, conservative uh, court uh, system in the United States. Yeah. First answer is I don't know. But the second answer, is that younger judges can afford to serve on the bench. Uh, so younger judges who uh, uh, often are coming from public positions, a lot of ours are prosecutors, uh, a lot of them have served in state government uh, and so on. Uh, a lot of them are not leaving very large salaries in law firms to uh, join the high court. Uh, the real answer is we don't know. We suspect, that uh, the Republicans who have been most active in recruiting judges have taken a leaf out of the federal uh, playbook. Uh, as you know, uh, the uh, average age of the uh, US Supreme Court nominee has fallen dramatically in the last 30 years because presidents want judges who are gonna be around for a while. Uh, similarly, governors want uh, judges who are gonna be around for uh, a while. So we don't know, but I suspect it's the case that the, uh, the agents recruiting these judges to the bench, will you serve? The agents are looking for young, ideologically predictable 
individuals in just exactly the same, same way that Biden will look for a young, ideologically predictable nominee to the Supreme Court if he gets a nomination. Okay. Uh, Karen Weatherman asks uh, that when, you know, when we vote for judicial candidates, they're listed uh, as nonpartisan uh, positions, at least in, in the state of Washington. Uh, and she asks, how can we as voters discern the party leanings of candidates in such elections? Or do you believe it's better that that information is shielded from voters? Well, okay. Um, so um, let me expand that question a little bit. We're very, very uh, strong opponents of nonpartisanship. And uh, we rely, uh, uh, we drew our conclusions from our own work, but also from the work of Brandis Keynes Roan and her team at Princeton. Nonpartisanship allows individual decisions to have disproportionate impact on the voters. Party shields against individual decisions having a disproportionate impact on the voters' choices. So what happens in uh, nonpartisan uh, elections is that judges wind up having to defend the single case in which they let the rapist go free. Um, you've seen those ads in uh, judicial elections and nonpartisan and partisan uh, elections. Party provides an anchor for voters, a much more rational and realistic anchor for voters. Now, how do voters know? Well, as you know, there's a lot of change going on in Ohio and Michigan. Those are the two poster children for uh, partisan and uh, nonpartisan elections. Um, but uh, I don't know so much about Washington, but I bet you a nickel that your unions are uh, telling their union members who the Democrats are and who the Republicans are. Uh, most likely, a uh, political organizations of every uh, stripe are uh, providing uh, voters, uh, at least when they used to vote in person, hand cards that uh, it, tell them uh, who to vote. When, non, when there's no information on the ballot, people vote on silly criteria. A uh, great example is, um, is a judge um, um, in, um, uh, um, in Texas, who was, um, uh, let me, I, I don't have time to make that example. When there's not information on the ballot, people will make inferences about gender, they'll make inferences about race, they'll make inferences about a whole bunch of things that we probably as political scientists think they ought not to be making their decisions on the basis of. Party is a far more informative, reliable, and rational means of making a, a decision about state Supreme Court votes. Okay, so uh, we only have time for one last question uh, from uh, Carissa Milgrove. She asked a question, I'm sure it's gonna be difficult to answer, but she uh, asked a question about a case we had here in the state of Washington back in 2012 named the McCleary case, McCleary versus state of Washington. It had to do with like the Kansas cases, uh, funding of, of uh, public schools in which the court uh, ruled that the uh, pre, uh, the paramount duty of the state legislature is to uh, uh, fully and equally fund a system of, of public education. And it went back and forth between the legislature and the court over a number of years. She writes that uh, almost a decade later, there's still significant inequalities between districts uh, within the state, largely due to school district funding that relies heavily on local property taxes still. And she asks... Um, since courts have already done what they can to solve this problem, what else, what else can be done in these types of situations? Okay, so one of the conclusions that we draw in, in this book is that if you want to solve the problem of the equality, don't rely on the courts to do it. We're simply echoing a Jerry Lowenberg's book, uh, whatever, 30 years old, entitled The Hollow Hope. Courts are not very good at creating social change. Uh, the governments uh, will figure out ways to defeat the efforts of courts. Uh, so uh, if you want to get uh, uh, it, uh, my own personal uh, recommendation is that if you want to get greater school equality, elect a governor who favors school equality, not a state Supreme Court, because the state Supreme Courts 
are going to largely share the values of the dominant political uh, group in the state. So, uh, so that was the point of the last graph that I showed before the conclusions. If you're interested in greater equality, elect liberals. If you're interested in greater inequality, elect conservatives. Uh, one final point, um, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I've forgotten her name, but there is a literature on the impact of these decisions on actual equality. And uh, that literature is often done, uh, written by economists our a friend whose name I'm blocking on at, Cal, at uh, Caltech, um, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name, has written an important paper. There is some literature that looks at not governmental decisions, but what actually happens down there in the trenches for the kids. Um, and that literature is perhaps worth looking at. Okay, listen, uh, I'm, 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 I'm I'm sorry that our time is up. Uh, before I thank our guest, uh, let me just remind you that our next uh, event in this series is next October on October 5th at noon. We have Aaron uh, Bobro-Strain, who's from Whitman College. He'll be talking about the role of inequality in shaping disputes over immigration in the U.S.-Mexican border. Now, uh, I wanna thank our, our guest today, Jim Gibson, for what was really a terrific discussion. Uh, fascinating, actually. And, uh, and let me also thank all of you for tuning in today, and I hope to see you all next week. Thanks, Jim.